uh, the format tonight is that we will have um, five speakers, um, each about five or 10 minutes um, uh, contribution, and uh, encourage you to put any questions uh, together, um, send them through on the chat. It'd be great if you could just signal that it is, is a question. So put a little um, Q or question, a colon in front of your question, and then we'll try and pick it up and ask the, the speakers. So when the speakers are going, um, then uh, there'll be any, we'll be able to ask some, um, we'll respond with some questions of clarification. Um, and then at the end of that, we will have hopefully about half an hour, 40 minutes of, of a panel session and a Q and A. And that's a chance to, to dive deeper in, into the issues. Um, so that's the format. Um, lovely to have you here. We've got a fantastic uh, roll up um, and uh, we've got well over a hundred people um, already. Um, so let's get, get cracking. Um, our first speaker tonight um, is uh, Jason Bilney. Uh, Jason is the chair of the Bangla Determination Aboriginal Corporation or BDAC. Uh, the Bangla people are the native title holders of the Kimber region and have consistently opposed the federal waste plan. Um, Jason, I'll pass it over to you to begin tonight. Howdy, um, can you hear me? Yes, indeed. Um, did you want to click on your, your video or would you prefer to just have the audio? I would just prefer to have the audio. No worries, you go for it. I don't know how to click on to the actual video. That's so, hello, my name's uh, Jason Bilney and I'm the chair of uh, PADAC and I'm here today in the, basically the middle part of my yard in Wala on Bangala country. And... Um, Firstly, I'd like to speak on behalf of Bangla and just to give you a bit of an update on the Bangla's decision. We'll, um, we'll stand, we stand uh, fiercely on this issue of nuclear waste issue. We've been through the, all the process with Minister Canavan um, assuring us that he'll put our votes together. We had a separate vote for the Bangla people and he assured us he'd put both the votes together. If he would have put both the votes together, it would have been 43.7%. That would have said yes and it would say so he would never have got the nuclear waste dump put where it was. But now we're going down a different different uh, path where basically if under the under the bill schedule 14, if, they were to, if he would have gave his reason to pick Napoli as the site, and then we would all have the we would all have the right as an, under judicial review, basically taking the umpire at the game, we would all have the right to question his decision why he picked Napoli. But now they're going to use schedule one of the bill and take away judicial uh, review, which is basically taking the umpire out of the football game. And so it's disrespectful to us as Bangla. It's disrespectful to all Australians, all Indigenous people right around Australia, where basically he's going to take that, now go through the court, go through the um, Senate and take away judicial review, where it's taking the independent umpire out, out of it. So we're still going to fight this course for Bangla people. It's, uh, you know, Nakabe is right in the smack bang middle of Bangla country. It, it's uh, basically got a storyline that runs through it. We were excluded from doing um, a heritage surveys. We did our own heritage survey. We were not allowed to go onto the actual actual site. So we did one next to it. And now the government, well, now Minister Peters wanted, wants us to do to do a survey, basically also offer us money for cultural awareness, but we're past that process. They're basically trying to, basically trying to bribe us. So we're still going to fight this issue and take it all the way. So it's all, um, how can I get deep to it? Um, it's very disrespectful to me as a Bangla person, also as a chair, disrespectful to my community and disrespectful to me, to me elders. And we're getting, gaining a lot of support from the senators, Conservation Australia, Conservation SA, all other Indigenous people right around, right around Australia. It's taking this fight to the next step and actually stopping the government pushing this legislation through to take away judicial review. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Jason. Um, yeah, you've been an incredibly clear um, advocate ar around that um, in terms of um, uh, the uh, clear opposition from um, Bangla people and the frustration, I'm sure, which you, um, which you have around the fact that that opposition is not being recognised. Um, and you're having to uh, speak over and over again the same thing around listen to us. 
Um, I mean, it's, it's been an incredibly frustrating uh, time. Um, can you maybe just, just talk a bit about um, what's been the impact on your community of, of this ongoing struggle? Impact of the community, it's very, it, it's, Kimber is the I say Port Gas is the crossroad to Australia. Kimber is basically the crossroad for the Bangla, for Bangla Nation, where basically from they travelled from the from the far reaches, which is in Gawler Ranges, down to the coast in the in the summer and back up to up to the Gawler Ranges in the winter. And Kimber is a is a very significant place and meeting place for the Bangla people. It's and the whole community is very you know very hurt. It took us 21 years to win a native title it was you know when they first announced it was the 53 year anniversary of the referendum what's that say to all indigenous people you know we've fought for 21 years for a native title and we don't have the right to vote for a big issue that's affecting our country we're still classed as foreign fauna it's very disrespectful to all all my community and all indigenous people and my past and present elders you know my like i said in the last webinar well you know my great my grandfather's side of the family but that was basically they didn't have the right to to oppose what happened with the Marilinda Tommy bomb. They, they was, people were told that there was no one out of the country and they suffered the effects of the radiation atomic bomb. Now I'm fighting the same issue on my grandmother's on my grandmother's side, which is Bungalow side, and it's very strong and passionate to myself and my family, but all Bungalow people. It's very, you know, now they're just basically taking away we're fighting this and we're trying to stop this nuclear waste. We don't want to build on our country. It's the part of a big storyline. It's the rivers run underneath and run all the way down to Air Peninsula. All it takes is one crack in the it's a big fault line, it takes one crack and get back in the water. It destroys our country right from the right from the heart, right down to the coastline. So all my community is very hurt. Yeah, that yeah, um, that makes makes absolute sense. There's a, there's a question around who want someone, uh, Ivan, um, would like to have clarified the number, the 43.75% vote of the combined Bangla and Kimber vote. Um, is it possible for you to just explain where that number comes from? That number comes from if you if you put the if you put the people if you put Bangla, if, if you would have done what Minister Canavan would actually have, have said that he would do. After the bear in mind, you know, that's about board con community consultation. It was only once that he met with us. But if you put the Kimber vote together with the with the 209 members of Bangla that voted, bear in mind about 80 80 percent of Bangla or 80 people actually voted in the voted voted in it. If you put Bangla and you put the Kimber vote together, it would make 43.7 percent. And that was in a previous uh, documentary done by done by, done by Matt, which is. Uh, states that Bangla speaks out and you would get that 43.7%. Mm. Mm. Thank you. And there's an, another uh, quick question, which is um, uh, not to be in any way disrespectful, but the prone you could say that you can be bought off. What is your response? Well, uh, that's just the way of... Uh... You can never be, you can, it's basically like saying, well, we basically can be bought off and sell our country. Well, we did, we, you, can offer, you can offer us a trillion, a billion dollars. It's not about money. It's about protecting and preserving our culture, our heritage, our sites, and, us, and protecting the environment as a whole. We're part of us being in Bangla, all, well, all Indigenous people, we're part of Mother Earth. Mother Earth, we look after and protect. Mother Earth provides for us. And you can never replace that. You can offer us a trillion, a billion dollars. It's not about money. It's about protecting and preserving everything. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. No, thank you, Jason. Um, that's a great, a great start. Um, uh, one more question, one more, one more speech to you, mate. It's also, you know, how disrespectful is it? Part of you know, native title. You know, all indigenous people fight for native title to get recognised, but then for a council to decide the fate of all South Australia, all Australia, let alone put in a clause that is rateable, like the judge said in the in the federal in the federal court. You basically created a hurdle. You should have had the gate open. You should have included the indigenous owners. But no, you didn't. You made a clause there which is rateable property. We are traditional owners. Why did that's a white man's term, rateable property? It's very disrespectful to Bangla, also all indigenous people. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, indeed. Fantastic. Well, thanks, Jason. And I'm sure we'll have more questions as we get to the QA session. Um, uh, great. Um, now Next, we've. I think I might go to um, to Peter Wolford next. Um, uh, Peter is a farmer and a grain producer who has played a leading um, community campaigning role 
against the waste facility as the president of the No Radioactive Waste on Agricultural Land in Kimber and SA group. Um, he's been a, a stalwart and, and, and a, a powerful advocate um, ever since this issue roared up. Um, and it's great that we've got, we've got Peter on, on tonight. So Peter, over to you. Um, here at Buckleboo. I just wanted to probably tonight cover some of the facts that we presented at the Senate hearing because I think it's very important that we do that. Um, I'm a third generation farmer uh, here at Kimber and we have third and fourth generation farmers in the Kimber in our uh, farming business here. I'm also a member of the Kimber Consultative Committee so I have meetings regularly with the government department and um, and hear everything they have to speak about. Um, we've always maintained this issue is bigger than Kimber and that the people outside of Kimber should get a say, particularly those neighbouring communities and the people of South Australia. It seems quite remarkable that we have such a national issue and it's just been um, kept in one little circle and no one else can have a say. After five years seeking a fair, unbiased, transparent process, it is impossible to put into words how completely gutted our members felt by the announcement of Nepandia as the chosen site. This proposal has caused and continues to cause division within our community and has had a significant impact on people and their wellbeing. This has been fuelled by the actions of the department in their quest to establish support for the facility at all costs and justify their decision. The finding of former Minister Kahneman and the broad community consent for the facility exists in Kimber, a basis on which the bill rests is tenuous at best. We want to make it clear that the Kimber community did not nominate to be in this process, an individual did. When you consider 452 out of 824 deemed eligible voters voted in support, that is 54.8%, and that does not constitute a willing community. An interesting fact to note, that in July 2016, when the Minister Freienberg removed Kimber from the process, stating the lack of broad community support and the division the process had caused. Now that support was at 51%, and that was stated by the department's report. So what has changed? To me, nothing. There's still strong opposition. We now know that the Hawker site was removed from the process due to the lack of support as shown in the result of their ballot. However, there was every probability this same finding would have been made in Kimber had the same voting rules been applied in Kimber. In, Haw in Hawker, members of the community living within a 50 kilometre radius of the site were all given the opportunity to vote it, in addition to those who live or pay rates within the Kimber, within the Flinders Ranges Council area. After a clear voice within the Kimber Consultative Committee called for the ballot to include a 50 kilometre radius of the site rather than just a local government boundary but it was deemed an unviable way to conduct the ballot, despite this being the process utilised in Hawken. Using only the council boundary to find voting rights meant that some people who lived closer to the handy site than those living in the township of Kimber were denied a vote and unfairly excluded. Former Minister Canavan gave clear assurances to the KCC members that the decision to use only the Kimber District Council boundary for voting would in no way discriminate against those living outside as they were invited, encouraged to write submissions and that these would be clearly categorised in a public document by place of residence and vicinity to the CIS site for his decision-making process. What we do know now is reported at the KCC meeting on the 23rd of Feb is that 2,789 submissions were received in total. And that in total, in that total, 94.5% of those opposed the siting of facility in Kimber and only 2.8 were in favour. These have been all but ignored in favour of multiple surveys, results from the same focus group, in favour of operating business based solely within the Kimber District Council area. The decision by the federal government to seek a volunteer site suitable for the disposal of low level waste and to temporarily store intermediate level waste is extremely short sighted. Also, selling the facility as a temporary storage for intermediate level waste, when in fact it may be several decades and realistic indefinitely is misleading. The department has continually stated the importance of having all the nation's waste located at one facility. We have always maintained that it would be a far more responsible solution 
to find a site that is suitable for the permanent disposal of the ILW and for the low level waste to follow to a single location, having one facility, one shift and one cost to the Australian taxpayer. As a farmer, and, and like many uh, of our members of our No Radioactive Waste Group, um, there's a real concern with that only 4.5% of South Australia is arable farming land, and Air Peninsula makes up a large portion of that. Our agricultural industry is still is in and will always remain central to our town and region, and this is why it is so important to maintain our clean and green reputation and not expose it to any potential risk at all from the perception and stigma attached to a nuclear waste dump. As farmers, we are required to conduct risk assessments, potential risks for so many of our day-to-day -day practices, including farm safety, livestock management, chemical use, just to name a few. This is all to identify and reduce potential risk to our industry. Despite our ongoing requests for an independent risk assessment, we are expected to allay our concerns based solely on a departmental fact sheet and assurances from an apparent roundtable discussion about which we practically have no information on. When the Minister announced that the Nepandi site had been identified, we were certainly surprised and confused that the decision was not declared as per the requirement of the Act. It is now clear that the reason for this is, is the Minister's decision to amend the Act to specify the selected site. This is extremely concerning to us all, as it is our understanding that the decision to directly legislate the selected site will effectively remove the opportunity for any judicial review of that site selection, which is something our community members, um, people from within the state of South Australia, and in fact, all Australians should have the right to ensure procedural fairness is not denied. It is quite remarkable when you look at such a national issue that this is where they're heading with this uh, piece of legislation. If it was so open and transparent, then why have they gone down this path? I'd just like to finish off with just a few questions for everyone to ponder on. As I've said earlier, it's, it's taken its toll on a lot of us that's fought this battle for five years, but why haven't people outside of Kimber been consulted and allowed to have a say on a, what is a national issue? Regardless of your view, why does the federal government want to put this facility on agricultural land in Kimber when productive cropping land makes up only four and a half percent of the state? How could a ballot of Kimber residents and ratepayers be valid of informed consent without any detailed business case and independent risk analysis against the agricultural industry? And why hasn't our state government and state politicians stood up for the people of South Australia, particularly when there is current state legislation that prohibits this facility? And as I said earlier, this has been going on for five years and we've been up against it all the way through on a daily basis. Finally, it's vitally important um, for everyone to contact federal senators about this issue, as they are the people who are going to be deciding not only what my future and our, my family's futures are and the futures of all the people in this area here, but the people of South Australia. And I certainly don't want my town to be known as a Kimber the dump town or South Australia be the dump state. But it certainly will be if this legislation is passed and it will be clearly open up a Pandora's box for this state. So I'll leave it there, Craig, but I cannot, can't emphasise enough that we were at a KCC meeting only a week ago, a phone hookup, and it was indicated to us then that uh, they believe probably October or November will be the debate and the, the a vote on this legislation. So thank you. Thanks, thanks, Peter. Um, yeah, could you perhaps just um, give us a bit more detail about how the the federal government has tried to sell the proposal to your town? What, what things we, have you been promised? Um, and, and, and what information have you been given about the kind of waste that you uh, are expected to receive? Look, I think, you know, there's, there's no secret about the community benefits package. There's been two lots of that. So that the first uh, one was $2 million. And interestingly enough, the second one currently in play at the moment is, the department stated quite clearly, Craig, that there was no money left. And um, so I've actually got a letter home here from Sam Shard, the department, saying, yes, it was fully expended, no money. And then lo and behold, as everyone knows, they, they pulled a rabbit out of the hat and had $2 million announced two days prior to the ballot. So that's just one thing they did. I mean, they've continually hammered us about um, nuclear medicine. And yet 
when we had Ali Patterson at the uh, forum in Kimber with over 300 people, I asked him the question about nuclear medicine and how much of that is used within Australia, and he said less than 10%. And yet they continually hammer us about to make us feel guilty that uh, we're neglecting people of this country of nuclear medicine. That is absolute garbage. I'm very offended by that, and, and so are a lot of people. Um, you know, they continually talk about also hammering us about the, um, and as you would know, the 100 sites around Australia that hold the waste and hospitals. Well, we know quite clearly now from the ANSTO, Hef Griffin was the one that has cleared that up so many times, that the waste that is at hospitals, apart from some um, legacy waste, very minor amounts, all the waste that's at hospitals will remain there. It will just go through its natural decaying process and won't be coming to this facility. So um, combine that with all the fact sheets, um, any meeting we have, Craig, we raise issues, it's just ticking the box. That's what the KCC is, it's a box ticking exercise. And, and I think it really, really goes to show now when we look at the Senate Economics uh, Committee hearing that the department are having an enclosed uh, session that no one can have access or see what they talk about. So when you talk about transparency and how they run this process and they continually say it's very transparent and open, that's rubbish, absolute rubbish. They just tick the box and do what they want. I'll just mention the package. There's a $31 million package that comes to the site, Kimber, if, um, if the facility wants it's up and running. Uh, $8 million of that is for training and $21 million is for a um, uh, package for the community to decide what they want to do with it. Right. Th thanks, Peter. There's a number of other um, uh, of uh, questions coming through. Um, one in particular, just a clarification around whether it's state or federal legislation that you mentioned before. Currently, there's state legislation in play. Um, and I think the only way that it can be challenged to some degree is, is I think it's section 14 of the Act where they set up a committee to look into the wellbeing and the economic uh, issues to um, a site being put in South Australia. But once again, it's back to front. It's no different to this process we're caught up in, Craig. It's, everything is back to front of how they've done it. So it is state legislation, but we know that the federal government can override that. But... Uh, of course, it's up to our politicians in state to really stand up and be counted here. That's that's the remarkable thing about this. Great, thanks, Peter. Alrighty, um, I might perhaps now go to um, to Dr. Susan Close to to, to jump on. And, and Susan, if you'd like, um, uh, please uh, make your video go live. You should have a little button at the bottom uh, which could do that. Um, uh, Peter and Jason both being a remote. Um, uh, I found it better to, to not do that, but it'd be lovely to have to see your, your, your face. Um, so Susan is the member uh, for the state seat of Port Adelaide and the deputy leader of the Labour Party in South Australia and has been a powerful advocate for a healthy environment and, and for human rights throughout her parliamentary career. Um, she is speaking um, on behalf of the party, in particular um, uh, Eddie Hughes, who who um, who is the, the the party lead, but um, he uh, unfortunately couldn't make it tonight. He's got a uh, a bit of a health issue. Um, but uh, but Susan is is uh, it's lovely to have her here. Um, so yeah, did, are you able to to press uh, go on your camera, Susan? Uh, it says. Cannot start video because host has disabled it. Oh, okay. So I'd love to, but I can't. <laughs> um, no worries. Well, um, um, Lawrence, if you could perhaps try and fix that up while, uh, while Susan begins, hopefully we can <laughs> get it going soon. That'd be great. Thank you. And uh, thanks, everybody. And, and Craig, thank you so much for uh, pointing out that, uh, that uh, Eddie is actually the lead. And so if there are some moments where I don't have sufficient detail, I apologise in advance. But... I have been paying attention. I'd also uh, like very much to thank the previous two speakers, uh, in particular, uh, acknowledging the importance of Aboriginal land. And I myself am meeting on Ghana land, but I know that we're meeting uh, on a broad range of lands and uh, for the Bangala people to have been treated in such a way as um, extraordinary. And, and I'll come back to that. I also very much appreciated uh, Peter's uh, contribution, which was um, very powerful from uh, another uh, landowner, landholder's perspective about what's happening um, in, in that part of the world. Uh, so look, 
I have um, three really significant concerns with this proposal, but I'm sure that we need to get fairly quickly into what is it we can do about it. Um, I'll, I'll, okay, I'm getting a little note about sharing video. Yes. Ah, Hello, excellent. everybody. <laughs> um, I hope my stripes don't cause too much trouble for people. Um, so obviously the, the uh, way in which the Aboriginal people um, the, have been treated is disgusting and um, I, I teared up watching that video that you all shared at the very beginning. The, uh, what it says about the federal government's uh, attitude to sovereignty is um, remarkable. Uh, in the worst possible way. Uh, and the Labor Party would never support anything to do with any kind of um, uh, nuclear waste, anything without a veto being provided to the Aboriginal people, to the um, whether native title holders or, or simply um, the, the Aboriginal people who uh, have claim in the area if native title hasn't yet been resolved. Um, there's a secondary uh, issue which comes fast behind that, which is this question of democracy. Um, the process was flawed from the start. The idea of simply saying, hey, who'd like to have some money to have some nuclear waste on their land is a ludicrous uh, approach. Um, but then to uh, not give full sovereignty to the Aboriginal people, in fact, to try to have them not be able to vote. Uh, the question that was um, discussed in the last presentation about who um, gets to vote. So is it all the people who are affected locally? Not even that, let alone all the people in South Australia who are essentially affected by having this um, located. Uh, what does agreement constitute? So the percentage of agreement uh, that needed to say yes seem to wander around and then uh, changing legislation in order to squeeze this, this location in. Um, it, it's all just, an affront to any kind of uh, democratic process and, uh, and is appalling. Uh, the third element is um, this real question of the, the cost and the risk associated with the actual materials. So let's pretend that the process was a reasonable one. It isn't, but let's pretend. It also has some very serious questions that need to be answered about what this repository constitutes. Um, I was uh, horrified some time ago when there was a, a talk on the radio about the vote in Kimber, uh, that it was presented as simply being hospital waste. So it was interesting to hear that um, Peter has also uh, noticed that um, being repeated, that it's the idea that this is hospital waste, where it substantially isn't, and it may entirely not be. Um, and also that there's some sort of temporary nature to the intermediate waste, uh, which doesn't appear to be any conform to any interpretation of, of uh, temporary that I have in my dictionary. So the, the, the management of it as a facility, what it is, the transparency around that and the length of time it, which is supposed to be, it's supposed to be stored for uh, particular stages. Again, complete abomination of process and therefore sort of washing back through how are the local people and how are the uh, uh, Aboriginal people expected to make a reasonable decision when they're not being given all of the information, when there's a huge amount of misinformation being put out uh, and when there's a, a, a lack of transparency. So all of that says to me that they are um, hiding something, that they, this is, this is some, that something much dirtier than they want to talk about up front. And it may not be true. But that, that gives one to speculate and to question, doesn't it? Um, now, all of that, I think we're all agreeing, we're all in furious agreement about this as a problem. What can one do about it? Uh, there is, as Peter pointed out, a piece of legislation in South Australia that Mike Rand put in many years ago. Um, but that legislation can, as Peter pointed out, easily be overridden by the federal uh, parliament. And so therefore, I think, um, although it is disappointing that the state government has remained completely on the sidelines on this, I don't think it said anything particularly positive, although it may have, but it certainly hasn't raised any questions about this. It hasn't, on behalf of the people of South Australia, raised any concerns at all. Uh, that, that aside, though, this is substantially a federal problem. And uh, I, I think the, the feds need to hear it fair and square. 
Um, now, what I don't understand well enough, and that's my fault, um, partly my fault for not being Eddie, uh, is what it is that could be done in the Senate that could uh, upend this. Because if it is able to be upended um, by the Senate, then I think there is a serious chance for that to occur. It's a very volatile place. Um, there are feisty lib Labor and uh, independent people, you know, minor party people, Greens, um, the, uh, the uh, Alliance, um, Cent Central Alliance, that uh, might well be able to do something um, that would really set set this issue back for the federal government. One thing I've observed, and I'll finish on this, is that the COVID crisis has caused um, a, a, a great deal of difficulty for any, any issue other than uh, the, the pandemic to get a lot of fair play. But it doesn't mean there's none. And every so often something is able to flare up. Um, so I, I would hope that this can get the attention it deserves at the Canberra end. Um, and the Canberra Press Gallery ought to be quizzing Scott Morrison on what he thinks he's doing to prime agricultural land, uh, what he thinks he's doing to the sovereignty of Aboriginal people. These ought to be questions that are being posed to him. Um, and it's, I guess, a matter of all of us speaking up uh, and so I want to hear more from you about what you'd like to see from state labour and uh, whether there's more we can do to advocate with our federal federal friends for you. Fantastic. Thanks, thanks Susan. Thanks. And um, yeah, it was, it, um, yeah, it is clear that, um, that state labour um, has an unequivocal position and it is very, very welcome um, uh, around that, um, particularly around the right of veto, which is clearly hasn't, um, played out as it should in this instance. Um, when it comes to, to, to federal labour, um, there's traditionally been a kind of a, 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 a bipartisan um, uh, agreement over many years of, of somehow ultimately the need for some sort of uh, dump across Australia somewhere. Um, what's your sense in terms of, of, of federal labour currently around how they feel about Kimber? And what are the opportunities for, 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 um, for trying to influence them? Yeah, and I'll, I'll have to take that on notice because the last thing I want to do is speak for my federal colleagues. Um, but I would be astonished if they didn't have at least the same range of concerns that we're talking about because they are very reasonable concerns and questions. Um, whether they want to uh, you know, get particularly active, uh, I, I simply don't know. It may be that it's also being misrepresented to them at the parliamentary level as being about hospital waste, you know, aprons and gowns and you know uh, and we've got to do something with it all of this this narrative that um, they see the the proponents seem to have been quite successful at um, but if if there's a feeling amongst this group that that message isn't being sufficiently heard then I'm happy for Eddie and myself to take on um, making sure that we are a good conduit to get that information through Great, thanks, thanks, Susan. I appreciate that. Um, there's been a series of questions that have come through um, that actually touch. Probably, um, I'm wondering if we should um, uh, go straight over to, uh, to to Dave Sweeney to speak next because they, there's a series of questions around what's um, the actual plan that that has been proposed, um, and also, um, you know, what are the alternatives? Um, which I think is a really important question. It is, uh, is this the only option that, that we as a nation have got to deal with the radioactive waste that we've got? So um, I might perhaps um, uh, um, get Dave to speak next. So uh, Dave will need no introduction to many of, for many of you. He is the Australian Conservation Foundation Nuclear Free Campaigner. He probably knows more about uh, this floor plan and what the better options could be than just about anyone on the planet. Um, so um, over to you, Dave. A very big introduction there, Craig. Thanks very much. And thanks, uh, Craig and, and Cons Council or Conservation South Australia for, for co-hosting this event tonight. It's a pleasure to join you tonight. I'm calling in from Wurundjeri lands of the Kulin Nation in Melbourne and we're deep in COVID country over here. So it's really good to get outside the bubble after curfew, even if it's virtually. And I'd like to say that in these uncertain times, the last thing that any of us need is more stress, more pressure and risk. And this federal plan 
is deeply unnecessary. It's poorly conceived and executed, and it's profoundly irresponsible. It's deficient, and it's being driven by political imperatives, not public health or radiological protection ones. And as Pete Wolf had said, this is a national issue and deserves a much greater degree of national attention. So I really welcome Susan Close's uh, uh, commitment to take this and elevate this in the federal sphere, because that's where it really needs to uh, be heard. The planned facility, like I've been asked to comment about what the actual facility is and some alternatives. So the planned facility at Kimber uh, has effectively two parts. The first part is to be a waste disposal site, a disposal site for low level radioactive waste. Now, this is material that needs to be isolated from people in the wider environment for around 300 years. This material would be taken to Kimber. It would be placed in 200 litre or 44 gallon drums, stacked on a concrete pad and covered with earth. There is no intention to recover or reuse this waste. It would be drummed, earth mounded and left. And that is the national disposal site. Now, the second part of the national facility is more complicated and less certain. This is the planned national storage site. And this is a site for intermediate level waste or ILW. And this material primarily consists of waste products from spent nuclear fuel rods from the operations of the Australian Nuclear Science and Technology Organisation, ANSTO, at Lucas Heights in Southern Sydney. Now, the LLW, the low level, needs to be isolated for periods of around 300 years. The ILW, the intermediate level, needs to be isolated from people in the wider environment for up to 10,000 years. So it is orders of magnitude more complex, more demanding and more serious. It's a big management challenge. The ILW is definitely smaller in volume, but it's far more significant in radiation than the low level waste. And about 95% of the radiation at any national facility would come from the ILW. And about 95% of Australia's ILW is currently located at Ansto. So the federal plan in relation to intermediate level waste is to move this material in containers and canisters to secure above ground shed at Kimber next to the planned low level waste earth mound. And then it's left there. And sometime in the future, another government will come after another process, currently unfunded, unplanned, unannounced and untimetabled. And they will take this intermediate level waste for deep geological burial somewhere else, sometime in the next 100 years. And that is the national store plan. It's extraordinary, really. It is not a credible plan, it's a political promise. And it simply makes no sense to take Australia's worst radioactive waste from where the vast majority currently is and relocate it to a regional site that has less checks and balances, less assets, and to do this with no long-term plan about what to do for this stuff into the future. In fact, the federal government has stated that it will not cons commence consideration of long-term future management of the ILW until it has relocated it to Kimber. Now, this is double handling and it is unjustified and irresponsible. The other thing about this that's quite extraordinary is it's also unnecessary. Most of this waste is, as I said, currently in secure above ground storage at ANSTO. ANSTO has previously stated that it can be safely managed there. And far more importantly, the federal nuclear regulator, our PANSA, the Australian Radiation Protection and Nuclear Safety Agency, has stated that it is safe for that material to stay out of ANSTO. ANSTO is not, and it really is important to be clear on this, ANSTO is not an appropriate site for a disposal facility for intermediate level waste. And indeed, there are laws that preclude this. But ANSTO is absolutely appropriate as a site for the extended interim storage of this material. In fact, it is not just appropriate, it is far and away the best site in Australia for this purpose. ANSTO has secure tenure. It has high level security with a 24-7 Australian Federal Police presence. It has the most sophisticated 
radiation monitoring and response capacity in our nation. And importantly, 95% of the staff is already there. No transport risk, no double handling, far less chance that future management will consistently slip from Canberra's radio, radar, and far less chance that this waste will become stranded at Kimber. And it's also absolutely and utterly possible for this material to be stored securely at ANSO. On June 30, in the course of this current Senate inquiry into radioactive waste and to the Kimber proposal and to the proposed changes to the government legislation, the CEO of the nuclear regulator stated that waste intermediate level waste, the serious stuff can be safely stored at Lucas Heights for decades to come. Now nothing, Craig and everybody, nothing about radioactive waste is clean, easy or simple. And extended interim storage at, at Lucas Heights is not the end of the issue, but what it is, it's the start of the solution. Ending the Kimber push and adopting extended above ground intermediate level waste storage at ANSTO makes sense, saves dollars, is consistent with international industry practice and would provide time to have what Australia has never had. And this is quite extraordinary. Australia has had decades, absolute decades of inquiries, fights, he said, she said, over postcodes to place waste, always in regional or remote Australia. What Australia has never had is a disinterested, objective, evidence-based assessment of what is the best way to manage waste. The question that has been consistently asked is where can we put it? The question that has never been asked is how can we best manage it? So we need to change the question and then we can start to advance a credible answer. Now builders have a very sensible maxim they say, measure twice, cut once. And we say exactly the same thing. The federal government's planned facility at Kimber, it proposes double handling of our work, worst waste. And it's a striking example of where an arm of government has captured national policy development. ANSTO make and store the majority, the overwhelming majority of Australia's radioactive waste. They want to physically shift and cost shift this material away from Sydney. Now, I can understand that from Ansto's perspective. If Kimba happens, it would be less pressure on Ansto's place and less pressure on Ansto's purse. So the plan is clearly in Ansto's corporate interest, but it is demonstrably not in the national interest. And as we've heard from Jason, it's not in the traditional owner interests, as we've heard from Pete. It's not in the wider community interests or the grain growers interests. And all Australians have a responsibility to ensure that we best manage radioactive waste. When, I think this is really important, and I'll, I'll close on this, Craig, but I'll just say, when every federal politician, ANSTO executive and webinar participant is dead and gone, all of us, this waste will not be dead and gone. So we need to give ourselves and those who come after us the most options and the best chances. And in this case, this starts by not playing short-term politics or doing short-term political posturing with a long-term carcinogenic waste. In the short term, with this issue, we need to work to ensure that the planned amendments to the national legislation, which are currently before a Senate inquiry and will be before the Senate in September, October of this year are not passed. Those planned amendments are simply to cement Kimber as a site and then to isolate that site from any contest or legal review. They are outrageous, improper and unnecessary. They are profoundly irresponsible. Labor, to their credit, joined with crossbenchers and independents in the House on the 11th of June and voted against this legislation. Labor in the Senate absolutely need to do the same. This legislation needs to not pass the Senate and the government needs to be forced to come back 
to some form of drawing board to revisit the question and frame it, not as in what postcode is vulnerable and can we bribe, bully or bypass, but rather ask what is the responsible way forward for all Australians with this material. So that is the request to Susan and the South Australian Labor Party who have come out strongly against this to reinforce that with their federal colleagues. It's the question for all of us to con contact Labor senators and non-government senators to say, do not support this legislation. And that will give us the time to do the serious hard work and ask the serious hard questions about how do we manage a material that poses a hazard for 10,000 years. Thank you. Thanks so much, Dave. Um, that was a fantastic overview. Hey, just a quick question that's come up um, through, the, through the chat is around, I suppose, what happens next in terms of the Senate process? So you, we, we, there is this live piece of, of, of debate. So can you just, just um, give us a flavour of, 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 of the next sort of stage of that debate and what happens if it passes and also what happens if it doesn't pass? So I suppose to give a sense of, of what's at stake coming up. Yep. So the, um, it's, in, it's important to know that Minister Pitt could tonight sign one page document and declare Kimber as the National Radioactive Waste Site. He could do that. He has that full authority under the National Radioactive Waste Management Act for legislation as it currently sits. If he does that, that would mean that Kimber is the chosen site, but it would also mean that Bungala, Peter and the grain growers, anyone with standing and concerns, and there are many, could take legal action to contest that. The government clearly do not believe that their case would stand legal scrutiny, otherwise they would use their existing legal powers and do it. So this amendment is to quarantine any choice of Kimber from legal review. That's its sole purpose. So where that's at now is it's been referred to a number of committees. The Parliament's Human Rights Committee looked at it and said, we believe this could compromise and undermine Bungala people's human rights and cultural protections. So that was a cross to the plan. It's then been referred to the Senate Economics Committee, which is currently looking at it and we'll make a report on the 31st of this month. 31 August, that committee will report. Now, there are mixed views in that committee. Obviously, the government senators are supportive of a government act. The Labor senators seem to have various positions. And this comes down to the politics of how things will roll out. If the committee recommends and gives an all clear that this is a good idea and should be advanced, then there will be voices in Labor that say we should just advance this, support the legislation. The minister will have new powers and be able to declare Kimber and know safely that that can't be challenged by traditional owners or others in the courts. If the committee has a mixed verdict and a mixed uh, report, and if the Labor Party do in the Senate what they did in the House, and there has been no material change, none of the issues have been addressed, so there is no reason for them not to. If Labor vote against it or signal that intent to the government, the government can either lose on the floor in the Senate or it can pull this legislation. And then it has two options. It can use the existing legislation and go to court because Bungler have made it clear that they will contest. Others may as well. Or it can go back and what we would hope and what we're calling for is it takes a step back, it pauses, it accepts that the National Federal Regulator procedurally removed and intellectually superior to a lot of the voices in this has said the material can stay at Lucas Heights safely for decades. It would stop this false momentum about urgency, stop this phony linkage with nuclear medicine and kiddies with cancer, terrible scandalous behaviour, and it would get fed income without asking some hard questions. And it would find on the side of Aboriginal people, local communities in this country, and particularly the group I can talk for, civil society groups and environment organisations, a great preparedness to really try and tackle, with integrity and good faith, a difficult policy issue. At the moment, we are in the trenches. We would happily be prepared to come to the table. It's up to them. 
Great. Thanks. Thanks, Dave. Um, all right. Let's let's get on to um, to Karina. It's lovely that you've been able to to to, uh, to uh, get access. Um, bit of connection problems there before, but it's fantastic to have you here tonight. Uh, Karina, once again, is probably known to many of you. She is the chairperson of the Young Community Jajara Native Title Aboriginal Corporation. She is a powerful advocate uh, with deep experience of the lived impacts of the nuclear industry. And she's shared those experiences across the world, including on the floor of the UN. Uh, it's a delight to have you here, Karina. I uh, would love to hear your perspective. Thanks, Craig. I really appreciate it. And thanks everyone for all your patience with me. I've been um, flying down the highway dirt track to try and get some reception. So I, I really appreciate it. And it's always a tough act to follow after Sweeney and his, you know, very strong talk on, on, on some of the um, issues that are really happening around us at this time. And I apologise that I um, didn't get to see the other presentations like Peter and, and also Jason as well, but I'm sure we've, we've were all on the same page, of course, in trying to, you know, do our part slowly and bit by bit in, in really sending our strong message in the, the state of South Australia. And I think Australia, sh you know, South Australians should hold themselves really proud of the, the amazing campaign work that we have done over the many decades. And, you know, really work from that as well. It's certainly been an ongoing um, draw for energy and aspirations of the amazing campaigns before us as well. And I think Australia, South Australians should really think, um, you know, really positively that we feel confident we can take this on as well because of the past struggles that we've been through as well. Um, you know, knowing very well about the history of what happened in the 50s and 60s, and then also knowing that, you know, this dump issue is not new to us in South Australia. It um, certainly has taken on, you know, some amazing um, challenges with those amazing old women in the Gubaridi, Kungajuda and the Eredi campaign that was so powerful from the very beginning in setting the strong message and the legacy from that as well. I think that's something we can all draw on and, and work with. And I know one of the key messages that I took from that particular campaign was that it was everybody's issue. It wasn't just a black issue. It wasn't just a bungalow issue. This issue being a national radioactive waste dump is a nation's issue. And that is something that really has rung in my head and really has been sort of the drive for me in, in picking up the momentum and really starting to work on building those networks and partnerships that we have and using organization or using um, platforms such as the No Dump Alliance that came out of the actual Royal Commission that was run in the state of South Australia um, for the nuclear fuel cycle. That was, uh, of course, another huge struggle that all of us who have linked in tonight are very well aware of that particular journey and story and struggle that we all went through in South Australia to send a strong message to the world that we were not interested in waste and international waste as well. That came across very strong that we were able to really put an end to that story of the national waste dump and also um, international waste as well, which is really something we can work closely on to continue the fight that we've got um, ahead of us and um, really working on building those partnerships. I was lucky enough this week to have an opportunity to link in to the Federal Labor First Nations Caucus on Tuesday, which was a, a wonderful opportunity to just let them know that it was um, clearly not just a bungalow issue, but it concerns all First Nations across not only Australia, South Australia, but also Australia as well. And I think many were very um, interested in hearing the story about building those relationships and allies and, and really getting the story out that it is a national issue. And that is something that we're really 
um, from my Yangundara native title group are really wanting to work in building those relationships and those partnerships as well. I know Yangundara certainly lent on many of our First Nations group across the state of South Australia when the Royal Commission took place back in 2015 to 2017. We certainly reached out to many of our First Nations across the state to build that relationship and, and really show the safety in numbers and the need to work together and the forming of that No Dump Alliance as well. So we'll continue to do that work in No Dump Alliance and really build on those partnerships and arrangements that we have in place and continue to put those pressures on, but also to continue to put the pressures on our fellow First Nations mob as well for their support. And I know just in the networks, there, there are many who are waiting for the call. And I think now is the time for us to do a national call out. Um, it was really important for the First Nations caucus to, to know that there were other First Nations groups that were very concerned about the outcome of this. Um, and what the Senate inquiry would do, um, not, not allowing or taking away, or one, you know, one thing is the shifting of these goalposts, so to speak, halfway through a process, which has been really concerning. Um, and that's really worried me because of our activism up here in the far north of the state of South Australia, We've really been vocal about this in the past and we need to be vocal about it again um, as we go and face this. And I know that we're here in solidarity, Yangundara mob with our bungalow brothers and sisters. And I think we need to do a call out to the rest of our First Nations mob to really send a very strong message. And we've done that in the past and I'm really hoping that feeling the energy of our ancestors and our mob um, over the, the many decades that we have been doing our animal activism and our Aboriginal activism, that we can certainly stand in solidarity with Peter Wolford and, and the farmers at Kimba to really build that support network around them to say First Nations across the state of South Australia are not interested in a waste dump as well. And with that support, we hope that we send a strong message to build those relationships with our Labor friends and, and you know, senators and, and people to really build and lift that bar as well to, to get everybody on board and to really send that strong message and, and continue to um, be involved in the process. It certainly um, at times can be challenging and I, and I know that it is and, and I really hope that South Australians and the, and the way that we've done and handled ourselves over the many decades, um, I'm hoping this is our last fight that we can send again another strong message that South Australia is too good to waste. And I'm really hoping that from this webinar and, and everybody who's attended um, can certainly get that word of mouth out there to the rest of our community in South Australia um, to talk to your neighbours and friends and really continue the fight that we have because South Australians have done it and we need to do it again. And we don't want this dump in our state of South Australia. And we stand together. We stand with our fellow First Nations mob and also with our farmers and, and green groups and, and everybody to send that strong message in South Australia. So. I really hope there's some good positive outcomes, getting the word out, and it's great that we've had over 100 people tonight linking in. Um, you guys do your part in getting the word out and letting everybody know that South Australia is too good to waste. And thank you for this opportunity this evening. Apologies for not coming in at the time that I was scheduled for, but I'm, I'm glad I've certainly caught the tail end of this as well. So I really appreciate it, Craig. Uh, fantastic. Thank you so much, Karina. The, and the, the chat line is just a whole series of, uh, of, of wonderful uh, reactions from people who just think you are just the best. So thank you. Um, it, it really raised the issue around, around true community consent. Um, the fact that, that um, traditional owners have had to do this fight over and over and over again. 
Um, so yeah, Keen, in terms of as we sort of jump into the um, into the, the broader Q and A for all the panelists, um, yeah, really keen to get your thoughts around what would genuine community consent look like. We 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 had the the, the vote from the council. Uh, we had the the uh, Bungalow community having to and, and the mob there having to to get do their own vote. Uh, you look at international best practice, and there's there's a veto, which um, which Susan Close has mentioned, um, is labour state labour policy. Um, so, what would true genuine community consent look like? Over to the panel. Who wants to go first? Yeah, I'll kick off on this one, Craig. I think about this a lot, and you know, I imagine what it'd be like to be in a place where you actually had uh, genuine processes about meaningful and serious policy <coughs> issues. Um, I think a uh, first piece is that true consent would require clarity of what's being proposed. Um, and one thing through this entire process has been a lack of clarity from government and department about what's being proposed. Goalposts have, as people have said, have shifted. Employment, like the, the economic and employment uh, benefits, the community benefits package, um, for this project has gone from no community benefit and six full-time jobs to 45 full-time jobs, another 35 full-time jobs at a related agency in Adelaide and 30 plus million dollars to the local community. Now, those figures are extraordinarily rubbery. They have changed, as Pete Wolf had said, um, by convenience and political circumstances. And uh, so clarity about a proposal and credibility in the proponent and distance between the proponent and any assessing agency would be um, very key in, in measuring consent. Because what we have here is a proponent that commissioned its own research, its own focus groups, its own polling to deliver its own preferred result. Um, one of the other things is, and I keep coming to it, is we, we hear a lot about compliance with international best practice. Well, one of the things with international best practice is free, prior and informed consent. It's in the Declaration of Rights of Indigenous Peoples. It's used as a standard in many jurisdictions and particularly where a complex waste or industrial or economic activity and extractive activity interfaces with Indigenous or First Nations people. And to not count a vote and then to move legislation to exclude a day in court is the absolute opposite of free prior and informed consent. It is using your political power and processes to further marginalise those who don't enjoy anywhere near the same level. So I think really I would take what's happened in the South Australian context and over many years, as Karina said, and I would do nearly the reverse if I wanted to do, de um, determine what good consent look like. The other thing I'd do is I'd give some clarity as to what the threshold is. Pete Wolford and many others drove and asked for years for the federal government, what's the target? How many do you have to hit? How many do we have to hit for this thing to either stop or go ahead? And they never got an answer. The one time they got an answer was from Matt Canavan when he was the minister and he said, oh, 60, we need to be north of 65%. And then that was immediately fudged and turned down and it became, there'll be a variety of factors that the minister will consider. And those variety of factors were fudged, blurred edges and completely opaque. And there was this whole process of, yes, we're going to take in count. There's 800 people that have had a say on this. The 800 people are on the Kimber electoral roll, the Kimber council electoral roll. Now, Kimber didn't make the problem. Kimber's not solution, not uh, born to be the solution to the problem. This is a national radioactive waste facility, the nation's first purpose-built facility for material that needs to be isolated for a period of 10,000 years. Don't play politics about who's on the electoral roll, have a genuine and inclusive discussion. Because I think we're coming from a space here where the government actually lacks confidence, not only in its own processes, but its own citizens. People on this call, people in regional Australia, people throughout this country are not by nature vexatious or mischievous. 
we want stuff to happen, we want stuff to happen well and responsibly. If there's a good case made and people have a chance to engage, people cop it. If the outcome doesn't go the way you want, we cop it, we're all adults. But if there's a case where the case has not been made, if there's a case where consistently and at every turn people have been excluded or denied, then we do not cop it. We have enough spirit of no and enough spirit of fair play to say this isn't fair and we say no. And that's what's happening here. Thanks, Dave. Um, other panellists, did you want to jump in and, and add your thoughts? Can I just say everything that he just said? <laughs> <laughs> As always, Sweeney, you are so eloquent and you're 100% spot on. Well done. Thanks, Susan. Craig, if I could yeah, just Craig. add something. Oh, sorry, Peter, cutting you off there. No, way you go, way you go. My, my only comment on that one, thanks, Peter, for um, giving me the all clear. I just really wanted to just come from a First Nations and from an animal perspective, really, um, is to say that, you know, a lot of us and our mob in South Australia speak many languages. And one of the big issues um, for me in particular, up in where I'm located and my Yangundata group, is that half the information is never easily translated from English and complex language into Yangundata language. And that is an ongoing issue right across all sectors. This is a very complex one. How do we explain that and articulate that to our mob, our countrymen, our First Nations mob? to bring them into the conversation, to make them aware so they can make a decision. That is always one of my biggest headaches up in the far north is trying to get information that my mob can understand. The responsibility that we as First Nations all have is the responsibility of protecting our state and our munda, our country. That is the common, common ground that we have as First Nations mob in the state of South Australia. Those stories that zigzag and crisscross our state of South Australia are stories of significance from the north to the south to the east and west. Federal government fails to acknowledge that these stories are stories that connect and impact all of us as First Nations across the state. And we need to be there at the table. We need to be fully understanding what is on the table and what it is that they are trying to do. And as Sweeney always reminds us that this is very complex, but people need to be very informed about what it is that the federal government is trying to do. And what we see and what my mob sees is that goalposts are being shifted and they're maneuvering these to take our rights away and to take our voices away and the opportunity for us to challenge this. And that is not a fair game at all. And that is not fair on everybody in South Australia when a federal government is starting to flex what they can to override. My grandmother and the Erati Wandi campaign was very instrumental in setting that state legislation. We have legislation and here we have a classic example of the feds coming in and overriding us in the state of South Australia. My mob and every First Nations group across this state has a cultural responsibility in protecting our state. And this is where we need to unite as First Nations mob to send a strong message because our lives do matter and we are a part of this country as well. Great, thanks Karina. Peter. <clears throat> oh, you, you're on mute, mute there. You got me? Now I'm on. And I certainly agree with everything that's been said. It is very hard. And I mean, one question you get asked is, you really get, we need to know what we're voting for because it gets it's been changing. And, and I think for me, when you look at the Kimber district of 824 people, I made reference to it at the Senate here. It's a bit like having a Berlin wall built around Kimber. No one else is allowed to have a say. Now that is totally wrong on a national issue. We have farmers and families and people who live 20 k's away, they live closer to the site than what the township of Kimber does and they don't get a say. It, it's, it's just unbelievable, really. And it's already been referenced tonight about the citizens jury. We've got legislation in play and yet that still isn't enough. 
you know, we've had a lot of people have said, no, we don't want it here. Previously, and we as a, as a community, 40% of people here say no. But here we are, we're still going through the same stuff. So I've said all the way along, same as the others, it's bigger than Kimber and people need to have a say, regardless of their view. I mean, I want to be clear on that. I'm, I want people to have a say. It's about being fair. And at the moment, this is far from being fair, that's for sure. No, thanks, Peter. And, and Jason, it, it's interesting. I've, I've heard a number of people sort of um, who've kind of said uh, or, or, or doubted the credibility of the bungalow vote. Could you just explain to us how credible that, that was and what process you went through to make sure you got a, a decent representation of your community? Um, still on mute there, Jason. Are you um, able to... Let's see. Um, I'll be myself now. Yeah, ah. yeah, yeah, go for it. Right, Excellent. I'll start again. Right. So getting back to, to the question, well, it looks like <laughs> with the um with the vote for community support, you know, we had the I had to organise basically within a week. We would have had all of our members vote, but within a week you have to cover, you have to think about Port Augusta, which is only 70, 70 something k's from Wyala. Wyala to Port Lincoln's over 260, 260 k's. So, you know, to go between those three areas within a week is very hard to pull all the votes together, let alone bungle the people that are spread far and wide within South Australia. It had to be done postal and had to be done exactly the same as you do a federal or state election. You, you have to, we had to get a bloke come over with a vote box, vote, put it in an honest meeting, as well as send it out by mail. It was hard to organise all within two weeks. And we basically got 80, 80, 80 people out of 209 people, which is a pretty, which is pretty good in itself, you know, considering it was a week. If we had a longer time to do it, we would have had all our members do it. Um, yeah, it, and 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 the fact that it was a it was a formal process, I think, is is really important for people to know. It, it wasn't just your you know uh, a community group uh, you know doing a, a, a show of hands or at a meeting. It was actually a formal ballot which which you had to organise. Yes, yes, we had to organise the electoral uh, the electoral commission itself and get a I suppose a certified person that does the vote. So it, was, it was, wasn't. Um, wasn't corrupt in any way, where he sat there the whole time, signed up the paper, had to have documentation, your licence, same what you do in a normal vote. So you had to go through all that same process, but to do it in, within a week is very disrespectful to a bunch of people, but all Indigenous people, but we pulled it off with at least 80 people, but if you were to put them votes together with Kimber, it still would have come to 43.7%. Oh, um, yep, yep. Uh, I uh, mute myself then. Um, okay, so next question. Oh, getting back oh. to before, getting back to before what Karina, what Karina said, you know. Yeah. We have, we're, we're all Indigenous people. We have, you know, it's hard to, <coughs> it's hard to stack up. To, oh, shit. It's hard to stack up to what Karina said, but it's like, you know, we, we all as Indigenous people, we have a right to protect our country. You know, it is our mother earth and every flora and fauna has a, you know, has a story. So it's about, our obligation as Indigenous people to protect and preserve our country, not just South Australia, but all Australia, and standing strong and standing proud. And it's not just a Bangla issue or an Indigenous issue, it's an it's a Australian issue. We're going to have all the nuclear waste, so it should be, you know, everyone should have the right to vote. Let alone look at Wala, didn't even get to vote, and they're going to want to ship nuclear waste through Wala port. Mm. Mm. Yeah, indeed, indeed. There's a question which um, which has just come up, which is around why the rush, and and I reckon that it's there's a there's a bigger question there about what's really behind this. Like like all of you tonight have kind of explained why this is such a flawed process, and yet it's still going ahead. Can can you give it give the audience a sense of of what's really driving this this desire to ship waste that could stay at Lucasites across the South Australia? park it temporarily above ground while they work out what to do. Why, why is it going ahead? That is a really, really good question because there has been a profoundly manufactured sense of urgency. There is a sense of urgency here. We, we don't have to do something in a hurry. We have to do something well. Um, and it's a strange combination, I think, of two, two major drivers. Lots of people have lots of... Um, 
uh, concerns and there's varying degrees of evidence and join the dot ability of those concerns about will this lead into another push for high level radioactive waste, international radioactive waste, is this a Trojan horse? So there's all that, but if we, even if we park that, I see two key drivers. One is ANSO. ANSO, the Australian Nuclear Science and Technology Organisation is the single biggest beneficiary of this uh, proposal. The single biggest beneficiary. And both major parties in government listen to ANSO with a view that they have come down from on high with the truth from the mountain. Um, so one is ANSTO's corporate agenda being pursued aggressively, relentlessly and consistently in Canberra. The second is a sense of institutional momentum. This has been a long running issue. In the early 1990s, Simon Crean was then the head of a labour department with the very sort of apt um, acronym of DOPI, the Department of Primary Industry and Energy. And Simon started a process, let's have a desktop study to find a site for radioactive waste in Australia. And three people in the department in DOPI started that process. And ever since, that has cast how we've approached this issue. It's cast in the question of where rather than how. And ever since there has been a succession of ministers with varying degrees of enthusiasm, energy and capacity who have tried to be the one to sort the issue. Martin Ferguson, Nick Minchin, Matt Canavan. There's been scores of them. And there is this sense that it just has to be done. There is this sense of it has to go somewhere. And it already is somewhere. And in fact, the overwhelming majority is in secured federal areas where it can stay. So we need to reframe the question and break that sense of institutional political momentum and Ansto's stranglehold over the discourse. Great, thanks, thanks, Dave. Um, <laughs> Karina, you've got a friend there. <laughs> That's great. Um, all right, we've got about uh, only about five minutes left, unfortunately, because there's so much more we we, we could dive into. Um, but um, I'm really keen to talk about what happens now. How can the hundred plus people on this uh, webinar assist um, uh, you, Jason, you, Peter, um, uh, and you, Karina, to stand strong? and stand in solidarity? How can we influence the, the, the processes internally within Labor, Susan? Um, how can we mobilise the community, Dave? Really keen to get a sense of, of, of what your advice is to this, this, uh, this group so that we can get active. Not sure who wants to go first, but maybe Peter, do you want to go first? Yep, I'm on channel. Uh, yeah, look, at this stage, uh, Craig, look, we have certainly sent letters to all 75 senators. Um, we're in the process at the moment following up with a phone call. So I think people need to ring these offices. We need to get into the senators' ears because, as I've said earlier, they're the ones that are going to make the decision on this. And um, it concerns me greatly that we know what politics is like. Deals get done behind closed doors. It happens all the time. So the more people that can voice their concerns from all over this country, from different avenues, the better. And uh, really, we haven't got a lot of time to do this. So we would encourage everyone to firstly, I believe the, the, we're requesting a, an independent risk assessment for a start, but also to get in the ears of those senators to say, well, look what's happening. This is the legislation they want to put through, the amendments is taking away the fundamental right of every person that lives in this country. And that's, that's the guts of it. So please uh, make phone calls, write letters, but get into those senators' ears. Great, thanks, thanks, Peter. Um, Jason, have you got any thoughts you could add to that? Um, I, I agree, I agree with uh, Peter, exactly the same way. Everybody needs to get out there, send letters to the senators. Like we've, we've already been, we've been meeting with senators because of the COVID, we've been doing it by phone conference and Zoom. So we've got a lot out there with independents, whether it's uh, the Greens, as well as in, uh, like other independents, as well as Labor, as well as today. Today was a um, had a phone conference with the First Caucus Indigenous Party and pushed it as an Indigenous perspective as well. So I encourage all people 
out there to pressure, pre pressure the senators, pressure the independents so we can stop this legislation going through. It takes away our judicial review. So we, the, the government can announce it right now under Schedule 14 of the Act. And then we can, we've got the right to review that decision, but they want to go behind and go schedule one of the acts. So we all need to stand together and, and fight for this and take it to all senators, all the all Labor, Liberal, Independents a lot and stand together. Yeah, great. Thanks, Jason. And, and Karina, you've, you've had uh, so much experience, unfortunately, in, in, in this area. What's your advice? Um, I think the only comment that I want to make is, is, is Jason is right that we do need to stand together as well. I think we can, if we can really build those strengths across our Indigenous and First Nations networks as well, and those have certainly come through. Um, it certainly is a human rights issue as well. And, and I think if we can bring it back to that as well, and it is, I mean, it always is, um, then I think it's really important for us to really try and um, you know, bring it back to us as, as human beings and the responsibilities that we have as well um, and build those connects within our networks as well, whether it's, you know, I mean, I've been talking internationally as well. So, you know, hoping that we can make all those noises, we can send those strong messages to the Senate, we can, you know, the, the mission is to, you know, derail this uh, changes and these amendments to this bill um, that is just so shonky at the moment. You know, you're just taking away people's rights and it is a humanitarian issue. And let's let's keep it to that very basic that it's, you know, we're all fellow Australians. Um, we have things and voices and, and we need to make this very loud and very clear coming from South Australia. And we've done that in the past. So let's draw on that and let's let's send a very strong message again this time. Wonderful. Thanks, Karina. Um, Susan, your thoughts from inside the tent? Yeah, I think it's um, really important that the message that goes to federal labour in particular is not, uh, and, and it's exactly what you've all been saying tonight, so I think you're completely uh, on the right path for how I think they ought to hear the message. And that is that um, while a lot of people have deep misgivings about um, the, the new, use of nuclear material altogether and having any kind of repository for it, that this is not able to be dismissed with the response, well, we need to put it somewhere. Uh, that, that everyone who's got concerns accepts that but there are deep uh, process and scientific issues that have been completely ignored in this process. Uh, so the importance of Aboriginal voice, I think is uh, very, very persuasive and powerful right now in particular. I think the uh, idea of wherever it goes, ultimately it ought to be decided by uh, a lot of Australians, not a few Australians, is important. Uh, but then before even the question of where, uh, as, as Dave said, uh, it's the how. And that has not been done properly. And so you're not asking for this to be ignored or deferred indefinitely, uh, which I think people who don't want to listen might want to hear from you. But you're very clearly saying we're responsible and we're responsive to science, and therefore here is an appropriate process that ought to be undertaken for how we manage this material in this country. And then look at what's happening right now, look what, it's hap what is happening to the Aboriginal people, look what's happening to the people who are living uh, in South Australia, in Australia. So I think it's very important that you not allow yourselves, and I don't think anything you've said tonight would do this, um, but I just want to emphasise, not allow yourselves to be able to be dismissed as simply anti-nuke. Uh, because knowing my party as I do, they uh, will be responsive to hearing that wider story of, we understand this is an issue to be addressed maturely as a nation. Here's the scientific approach. Here's the democratic approach. And here's the way that we truly respect First Nations people. Wonderful. Thanks, Susan. And finally, Dave, um, yeah, your thoughts. Yeah, thanks, Craig. And, and yeah, I agree with Susan. I think it's really important to convey that 
we are, are not saying do nothing. We're saying do nothing stupid. We've got time to do something <laughs> well. So let's do it well. Let's use that time. Um, I think it's also like on a state level, the South Australian government needs to feel some pressure and some heat to defend the state laws. There are state laws that were introduced by uh, the Liberals, passed by Labor, to stop this very thing. They should, Premier Marshall and Dan Van Hulst Pelican should not be coasting through when they're not honouring a state law. You don't pick and choose laws. If you're in a position of responsibility, if you're a Minister of the Crown, you uphold the law. They need to do that and feel some heat about it. On a national level, it's really clear. It's non-government senators to not support this legislation. Do not facilitate taking away Aboriginal and other people, directly affected people, directly opposed people's right to have a day in court. You're not saying no to everything. You're just saying no to people who are directly affected having legal recourse. That is profoundly improper. So that's the first thing. Don't let this legislation go through, Senators. Uh, they would be the two key things, I'd say. But I think it's really important to note, Craig and everyone, that the reason we're having this fight now is because people, and particularly led by Aboriginal people for decades, have won this fight everywhere else. All the way up the track, from the Northern Territory down to Kimber, there's been proposals and they have been resisted by communities. And that is proper that they have, and those, that resistance has been successful. And we should build on those lessons and strength, and we should win it, like Karina said, one last time, so that we then have the real fight, which is the room where we sit down and ask what we actually do with this stuff. We need to move away from the rhetoric, and we move, need to move responsibly as a nation into how do we deal with this stuff. The first step is to stop a stupid cut and run plan, which is what Kimber is. Wonderful. Thank you so much to our fantastic um, uh, panel. Um, Peter, Dave, Karina, Susan and Jason, you have been incredible. Um, uh, the, all these, uh, the, the chat comments about how much people have learned. Uh, it's because you are articulate, you are um, you are wise, you are passionate, and um, it really comes through. And, and we really appreciate um, you sharing your, your thoughts tonight. Um, also, thanks to, to ACF um, and my organisation, Conservation Council, for, for hosting tonight, and Lawrence and, and Kate for, for support. Um, really appreciate that. Um, uh, yeah, the essential message, everyone, please um, hear what you have heard tonight and turn it into action. We've got this um, incredibly short uh, window where uh, something great can happen. If, if that uh, Senate legislation is knocked off, the, the game begins again. The, the, the clock stops and re resets and there's a real chance for us to turn this around. So um, please get active. Please make sure your voice is heard and uh, let's not stop until we win this. Thank you so much again for everyone's attendance. Um, it's been fantastic. Thank you. <clears throat>